Denver, Colorado. Denver, Colorado. And what's the weather like there? It's it's better today. We've had some really bad fires here. Four forest oh, fires. Really? Yeah, oh. that's made the air virtually unbreathable for the last couple of weeks going outside. Well, that's horrible. We've just had a lot of rain, but that's England for you. My dog's yeah. trying to get in on the act. It's all right. Have you ever made it out this way? Like, no, no. In your travels? I, no, I haven't been that far. Furthest to into America I've been is Chicago. Okay. And then over to LA. And furthest south I've been is New Orleans. I've never been to New Orleans. I've never made oh, it out New there New Orleans yet. is gorgeous, except for one thing. The humidity is absolutely horrendous. I could not believe it. I went there in May and it hits you like a wall. And the people who were hosting me, because I was there to give a talk, I said, God, if you think this bad, come back in July. I don't think I could tolerate humidity. We're really not used to it here in Britain. I, I'd find that, I don't mind dry heat, any amount of dry heat, but. Sure, same, it yeah. It's very dry here. The The weather here, it's a dry heat. We have virtually no humidity. Oh, no, I've been to Texas. Texas. I went last year to the South Southwest Edu. Festival. Oh, in Austin. At right? Austin. I yeah. didn't like Austin at all. Really? I've never been that far into no, Texas. I, I flew in and flew out, and I thought it was really boring. Everybody talks about it, it as a boring. very charming place. Well, basically, I flew in, flew out, and spent the whole time in a concrete convention center. So, ah, um, uh, yeah. Oh, mind you, we did have a couple of very nice meals out in Austin. The food is great. Very much so. Yeah. My first official question for you today. I'm going to start very softly with. Uh, it. No, we better get two going. questions. Why did George betray the Romanovs, and did Anastasia survive? Oh. I'm kidding. Kidding. My right, good. Don't say he betrayed them. It's much couldn't more. resist. I couldn't resist. I know yeah, you hate those questions. Great question. You do you know every time I uh, until COVID hit, of course, every time I do a literary festival talk about the Romanovs, there are always two questions. Always. Right. I those are the first two. Why did George betray them? And did Anastasia get away? <laughs> and it drives me nuts. So really my first question then is, when did you first fall in love with Russian culture and history? It happened in my teens, uh, when I was about 15, when I was at girls' grammar school. And um, I fell in love with Anton Chekhov's short stories. But I also always loved Russian cinema from a very early time. And I remember struggling to read Dr. Zhivago when it first, you know, came out in translation and just fell in love with Russia, all things Russian. I loved Russian music. And it, it kind of, something in my psyche, responded how, how are you exposed to, to those things like the movies and the music sorry how are you exposed to those things the oh, music well, and the movies music because I, I i i got the the records and i listened to the radio i listened i listened to the music a lot on bbc radio 3 the films i got introduced to on television because in the early days of big channel bbc 2 they used to regularly show a lot of foreign language international films with subtitles and they used to do whole seasons of Russian films. So I fell in love with a lot of uh, Russian movies that way. And of course, the one thing I really loved was the huge Russian War and Peace, which is about seven and a half hours long. Yeah, yeah. Sergei Bondarchuk's fantastic film which was done in oh, 1969, was it? Anyway, he used, yeah. half, he used half the Russian army to recreate the battles with Napoleon. And that film just so captivated me. And I've, I must have seen it about half, half a dozen times now. So I fell in love with the Russian and all things Russian. I think it was because then, being the Cold War, Russia was so remote, so mysterious, so unknowable. And that, that's, that's, that fascinated me. So I was very lucky. I was given the chance to learn Russian at school. 
um, in the sixth form. And so I studied Russian at school and then went on and did it at university. It kind of surprises me a little bit that they offered it as a language um, that early on, especially at the height of the Cold War, right? Oh, that's exactly why. Because at the time, um, there was a growing demand for people to learn Russian, in, indeed. When I came out at the end of sixth form, having got um, O-level and A-level Russian, people were saying, oh, is she going to go into the civil service, go into the foreign office, i.e. be a spy? or into GCHQ or somewhere like that. That was a time when there was a lot of um, Russian being taught in schools and in the universities. Now it's shrunk back to virtually nothing. So many schools have dropped Russian. So many um, universities have cut their Russian courses back to nothing. And the other thing, of course, is now since the collapse of communism and everything, so many Russians have come here that you know and they all speak good english so is there isn't the same need anymore i guess for people to have learn russian so what what is it about the language that you so love i love its musicality it's very beautiful it's a very difficult language to learn you really have to want to learn it because you know you have to learn a whole new alphabet so it's like hieroglyphs when you start and my my reading and uh, rate was very very painfully slow it takes a long long time to get any kind of fluency reading cyrillic letters and in fact i never read them as fast as say you know arabic lettering so uh roman lettering so you know it was a challenge and i really really wanted to learn it but i think if i hadn't been so determined and wanted to learn Russian so badly, I might have been defeated by it because in the small group I was in, quite a few people dropped out because they just couldn't, they couldn't hack it, you know. Yeah, for sure. So what, I mean, I, I study the language. I can't pretend to have any great degree of fluency. What, what advice do you give for people who are studying it? Well, so where did you study it? Um, very informally, I, I moved to Ukraine in 2010, kind, kind of on a whim, to be honest. Really? And yeah, I'd never studied Russian, never studied Ukrainian. Um, I was working at a hotel here and was a manager of a very old uh, four-star hotel and was on a fast track to a career in this industry. I graduated university and I never traveled abroad. And I was feeling like my life was kind of empty at the time um, as I was working in a field where I made rich people's lives more comfortable than they already were. Yeah. So I wanted to go somewhere else. And I, it could have been China, could have been Korea, could have been anywhere. I tried Russia, but their visa requirements were more strict. And it's Ukraine, yeah. Ukraine didn't care. And so I went over there. Did you go down to Crimea while it, while it was still part of Ukraine? My great regret is I didn't get a chance to do so. Uh, I'm so grateful I went. I'm I sure. Went, I went twice because I did a um, lecture cruise around the Black Sea. So I twice got to go to Ukraine. I got to go to Livadia to the Romanov Palace there. I got to see Stalin's stature and went to the Sebastopol Museum and... And I'm so grateful. But to go back to your question, the advice for anyone learning Russian is you've really got to want to learn it. It's as simple as that. Because you it, it requires a huge amount of self-study and practice and just the drudgery of getting to know the letters and getting your speed up with the reading. And um, I just think I just wanted to learn it so badly. I stuck at it. Do you still practice every day? Well, no. I mean, I practice in the sense that so often there are things on the television where people are interviewed and it's, you know, Russian news or, you know, I've been following all the stuff about Paul Navalny. Um, and the other thing, of course, is um, Russian films. I, I go on Amazon Prime and there's a whole section. If you type in Russian drama, you get a whole load of Russian TV programs uh, and there's subtitles so you can hear the Russian. And every so often I go on there and I watch something in Russian as well. I find I cheat a lot and I'm, I'm reading too much of the subtitles. I understand oh, I better if I just listen. 
uh, if I just listen, I miss huge chunks of it because Russians speak so fast. Right. I, listen, I mean, if I saw the words they were saying written down, I understand perfectly what they were saying. But because they speak so quickly, um, I just can't catch everything. But I did, I have enjoyed watching stuff in Russian where I was surprised at how much I could understand. When did you first go there? Not for ages. Really? Not for a long, long time. Well, when I learned Russian, it was the Cold War. So first of all, getting to Russia was difficult. It was very restricted and also very expensive. I, you know, I couldn't afford to go to Russia. And then when I was at university, eventually there was the option to go to Russia and go to Minsk, which is actually Belarus, isn't it? Um, and do a, a boring language course there for about two weeks, or opt to do a second Slavonic language and go on a three-month exchange. And so I chose to do Bulgarian, and I went to Sofia University and had a great time in Bulgaria for three months, whereas the people who went to Minsk were absolutely miserable. They said they were watched the whole time, they went into local cafes and started chatting with other students and the KGB came in and pretty much rounded them up. They said it was quite intimidating. So I'm very glad I had the experience of Bulgaria, but I do regret never seeing Soviet Russia, I must admit, having had that experience because I actually didn't properly go uh, until 1998. So after the collapse of communism. So where was the first place you went to? Was there a place that just felt like a pilgrimage spot that you had to, had oh, to go to? I mean, just Russia, Russia. All I have yeah. to do is just see the onion domes, hear those bells, go into Russian Orthodox church, smell the incense, hear an Orthodox choir. And I just soak it up. I just love, love the atmosphere of Mother Russia. So the first trip I did with my eldest daughter, and I just about scraped the money to go because I was so desperate to see Russia. I did a voyage Jules Verne, um, um, sea, a river cruise from uh, Moscow up, you know, up the river Moskva, up and to the Sphere River and across to St. Petersburg. And then we flew home from there and I absolutely loved it. And we stopped off at quite a few lovely places en route. And I, I mean, I just completely adored every minute of it. Wow. Um, so when you were young, um, when you were a little girl, did you grow up in a house where, you know, history was talked about quite a lot? No, no. My no. parents were hardworking, um, lower middle class, quite, quite hard up. Money was very short. Um, my elder brother got into Oxford and they were terribly proud of him. Um, but th there wasn't the same support for me as a female, I have to say. I don't blame them. It was just the mindset then of their generation. But basically, um, young girls, when they came out of school then, well, my mother said to me, oh, you don't want to go to the university, do you, darling? Why don't you do a nice secretarial course? So... <laughs> To keep my mother happy, I did a nice secretary course and absolutely hated it. Uh, although it was always very useful having shorthand and typing, I must admit. Um, and I was miserable. So I went to university about a year later and did Russian, which is what I should have done in the first place. But no, I mean, there was no atmosphere of study, although my parents um, we talked about things, we discussed things, we listened to the radio, we watched programs on the television together. I can remember watching some of those Russian films I loved on BBC Two with my dad. So I got to ask you something about that. I find that incredibly fascinating, mostly because, you know, I, my interest in Russian was triggered when I was a little kid too. And mostly I think because of American movies and how they portrayed Russian people. And it's always pretty negatively. And I, as a kid, I always identified with the villains in the movies. Uh, when I watched I'm professional wrestling, I like, I like the bad guys more. And so that triggered my interest in it. But it got me thinking that 
I, there was never any Russian films, no Russian music. There was nothing around. There was in Britain, definitely. And then, so what, what do you think that was all about? Was it, was it just to train box. spies? Was it what, sorry? J just to train spies, just to get people interested to learn the language, learn well, the culture? Well, it and... slow, though it was a different ethos in America to Britain because Russian culture was promoted. There was interest in the films, the, the music, I mean, the promenade concerts every year. I used to listen to those. I absolutely adored Rachmaninoff, Stravinsky, Shostakovich. You know, I, 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 I knew all that music. I listened to, you know, we were pretty well introduced to it at girls grammar school I have to say I had a, a what I consider to be a very good liberal education all on the state for free thank you thank you thank you <laughs> I am forever grateful for that because um, I got a, I was introduced to a very broad spectrum of music art literature poetry at school my parents worked hard. They didn't have time to sit and read poetry with me or anything. But my dad enjoyed watching some of those Russian films with me. And I can remember dragging one of my younger brothers to see Bondarchuk's War and Peace <laughs> in the cinema when it first came out. And he actually enjoyed it. I mean, it's very long, but he enjoyed it. So, no, I mean, I, I think my interest in Russian, though, was largely self created through a very romantic, you see, you, your, your view of Russia was spies and intrigue and villains. In Mine sense, was yeah. romance and poetry and Rachmaninoff and Chekhov short stories. And the lady with the little dog, you know that story by Chekhov? Of course. Yeah. About the lady with the little dog on the promenade at Yalta. And I watched that film by Heifetz so many times in black and white, on BBC Two. And when I went to Yalta, I actually walked along the prom there and they got a, sorry dog, and they got a, a really naff sort of bronze statue of the lady with the little dog there. And uh, it was wonderful because I went to Chekhov's house in Yalta. And so, no, no, my, my, my imagination was totally uh, sold on Chekhov and that kind of romantic Russian thing and being Natasha being whirled around the ball ballroom by Prince Andre I mean that's every girl's fantasy isn't it I would think so yeah I mean <laughs> I'm not just, I'm not sure but I would imagine well it is it is you know it just makes you oh and the Russian actor who played him oh, what's his name I can't remember now but he was so handsome and so yeah. You know, I, it was just, I get maybe it was a hormonal teenage thing, but well, I did love funny? it. I, w I watched uh, Adventures of a Dentist for the first time this year. Have you seen that one? Oh, no. Who's, what, what film is that? I, mean, I, 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 I think his name, I, Kl Klimov, Klimov, maybe? He was the man who was the husband Klimov. of... Klimov. Yes. No, I don't know that one. Well, it starred, uh, maybe you know, Alyssa Freenlich. She's a, she's a fascinating woman. I think she's 83. She's a, as I understand it, she's a darling of Russian cinema to this day. Uh, she survived the siege at Leningrad. I mean, just seems like such a fascinating woman. She was a huge actress over there. And I watched that movie and she must have been, oh, I don't know, 20 or so when the movie came out. And I just fell in love with this woman. I mean, there's just something <laughs> about her, just the way she taught. And, and I can't say that she was the most beautiful woman. There's just this charm, this vivaciousness, a sense of humor that, you know, I've never seen before in another human being. It's incredible. Well, Russians have a wonderful quality. They have great dusha, you know. Yeah. Spirit. Spirit, and yeah. Warmth and depth of feeling. That's, I think, part of what I love about Russia and Russians. And uh, I know what you mean when you say that. Yeah. Um, no, I don't know that film, but I did enjoy on the anniversary of the revolution, um, going to um, a showing, a special screening of um, Eisenstein's film, um, October, October yeah. about the revolution. Wow. Wow. And they had a live orchestra who played the entire special score that was written for the film and it was about two hours non-stop they were playing uh, so it was the London Symphony Orchestra I think I saw it in the Barbican that was an incredible experience you obviously love your subjects yeah 
wouldn't you say? Oh, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. It's more than just an interest. You love these people. Oh, gosh. And all I, their work. I become totally involved with all my subjects. And once the subject's in my head, I, I find a book is writing itself in my head. I wake up early with ideas. I, I live the subject. I, I'm constantly thinking when I walk the dog in the morning, oh, what am I gonna, how am I going to deal with this issue in this chapter? What am I going to put in? What am I going to leave out? I constantly solve problems. Uh, when I'm, that, that hour in the morning when I walk the dog is great thinking time and preparation time. But I guess because I live alone, um, it's it's a very egocentric thing really it's the fact that i live alone so i've got the time and the luxury of of thinking about my work and probably doing doing more i mean spending more time at it than i than i would if i was married or in a relationship because i tend to carry on as i mean it's saturday i've been working yeah. most saturdays most sundays i'm if i'm not working i'm reading or i'm doing things in my study you know I, I, I or work associated things so are you are you pretty disciplined about your subjects uh what i mean by that is you've got a you've got a book say um caught in the revolution and you there's so many different tangents that you could have gone down i mean so many so many people that you study that could be books of themselves do oh, you oh, yeah yeah, yeah. I, I think mostly of, you know, the, the Women's Death Battalion, you know, thing that, that could be its own book. That could be its own epic, a series. Do oh, you ever well, get tempted? Well, been a Russian telly series. I watched it. Yeah. And it didn't have subtitles, so I watched it. The trouble with Caught in the Revolution is that I had to have a good cross-section. And some people, of course, were much stronger than others, but I had to create a balance. And so, in fact, I had far more people than I used in the end because I had to focus on the ones with the best memoirs or letters or diaries. So I have a huge card index of all the other people I know who were there who didn't get a mention in the book. I just imagine it's got to be hard to stay on tap. I mean, maybe your attention span is more concentrated than mine, but I think I would be chasing so many... Different. You have to be very disciplined when you have a big cast of characters of weaving, interweaving the characters, making sure that someone you introduced at the beginning of the book isn't left hanging, that you come back to them and then perhaps they disappear again and then you have to tie it all up in the end. And I'm doing exactly the same as that with the book about the Russians in Paris because I'm taking the Russians in Paris from the Belle Epoque of 1900s through to World War II when the Nazis invade. So again, I have a huge canvas of people. So that's what you're working on now? I've almost finished. I've got one more chapter to do. Oh, I can't wait to read that. That sounds great. So it's now sort of 1937, 1938, and everyone's very miserable and unhappy and homesick, and they want to go back to Russia, and then, of course, the Germans are going to arrive, and there'll be a few people committing suicide, I'm afraid. It's all very tragic, actually. It's a very sad story. Yeah, very appropriate, I think. Oh, it's for... very Russian. It's yeah. very Russian. This terrible longing... For Rodina. Uh -huh, yeah. You know the word Tuska? I, that longing. I, yeah. Longing is it's like homesickness, but even more powerful than the word homesickness. Um, there's this terrible longing among them, all these exiles and emigres, to see Russia again, to go back home. What 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 is that? Is, is that definable? Is, is or is it something it's that never very, really existed? Very profound spiritual sense of Russianness that the Russians have. But yeah. I'm I'm not going to say that other nations are any less uh, attached to their homeland or any less patriotic. But in the Russians it it the anguish they went through for about being forced to leave Russia. And in the end some took the risk of going back and then of course ended up in the gulag. Yeah. So there is this terrible melancholy about Russians. And um, so a lot of them did, did find it very hard, never really settled in Paris. They never really integrated. 
they kept their Russian, they lived in their Russian colony, they kept their Russian customs and their Russian shops and right. and really they they were quite a separate colony and it was only their children and the next generations who began to assimilate. Let me ask you about a couple of the big big people here. Lenin. Um, do you find Lenin an interesting person to study oh, yes. and yes. write about? The well, reason why I ask, I ask it in that sense because, you know, I've read a lot about that guy and he is no doubt one of the most important figures of the 20th century. Yeah. And yet I find a lot of biographies about him. He just seems like such a boring person. Oh. You know what I mean? <laughs> Even as many travels as he had, it's always, you know, and then he studied vigorously in a library. And it's, all right. Well, that's why I wrote my book, Conspirator, because I, would, I knew right from the, the start, you can't do a young Lenin like you can do a young Stalin, which Simon right. said. Because Lenin isn't sexy. Stalin wrote Thank you, yes. Yeah. He had sex with underage girls. You know, he had a string of women. Lenin was a monomaniac who was focused on the revolution at any price. He did have a secret sex life about which I've written right. in the, at the end of my book. But basically, I thought, I want to write something about Lenin because he did interest and intrigue me. But I thought, there is no way on God's earth I want to write a conventional biography of Lenin and plod through all the politics because it bores me rigid. Oh, but what yes. did interest me was the period when he was constantly on the run, moving around Europe between 1900 when he was released from um, uh, exile in Siberia to 1917, um, April 1917, when he went back to Russia on the sealed train. And I was really interested in how he lived and, and the mundanities. What did he do for money? What did he eat? What kind of flats and, and accommodation? Excuse me, but hiccups. <laughs> what kind of accommodation did he and Nadia live in? And the other thing, of course, that's quite interesting is that they traipsed around with mother all the time, or rather her mother. Yeah. He had mother-in-law living with him most of the time. And, you know, he was always in meetings. And when he wasn't in meetings, he was in the library. And occasionally he went to a brothel. I'm quite convinced of that, which is how he picked up syphilis and then ended up dying of neurosyphilis of the brain. Only, of course, the Soviets covered it all up. Anyway, so his life in exile actually is really interesting. I thought it was interesting. And I wrote as lively and interesting an account of that as I could. But I would never have wanted to go beyond that into the heavy duty Soviet politics. Hmm. Um, you came under a little bit of fire, didn't you, for postulating that he died of syphilis? No. No, really. I, I, maybe, uh, maybe I'm, Wikipedia I, was wrong. I, I, I'm, I, I didn't say it categorically. I argued that it looked from what evidence I'd been able to find um, and, and I talked to quite a few people who had the same feeling as well. And I spoke to a, a medical specialist who got it from the horse's mouth from um, Soviet doctors in East Germany when wow. he, he, was a, he was a cancer specialist and he worked in a, a big clinic in East Germany where he met some of the Soviet doctors who, who came over and they told him. It was, so it, Lenin knew? What? That he had it? I don't know. Um, I, I, I mean, there's no, there's no source material on it. Thank Anything you. about his, um, his medical history was suppressed, except I do know the other thing. Um, I mean, there are things in an article I wrote, but um, the other thing was that, that, that when he died, the doctors were all told, his, his Kremlin doctors were all told on pain of death, you mustn't reveal this. And um, I think there's a very strong argument neurosyphilis um, did he did he care about people at all no not people at all were, okay, people were the, human beings were lab rats to Lenin mm. they were all part of his great big socialist experiment all that he cared about was the revolution achieving the revolution at any price um, uh, he was a theorist a cold-blooded theorist 
And although he was not without human empathy and sympathy, for example, he loved his mom. The, his mother was the only person who ever received an affectionate letter from, from him. He liked mm. little children and he loved cats. But, <laughs> uh, but no, he wasn't an empathic person, not at all. He was ruthless. I, he was as cruel and amoral as Trotsky and Stalin. Uh, the trouble is people tended and probably still do to present him as being the good guy of the revolution no he you know lenin wasn't as bad as stalin he wasn't as brutal as stalin well i think lenin could be equally ruthless um but he was he was basically the ideas man the theorist trotsky was the firebrand the public orator and stalin was the dogged backroom boy who signed off the lists for people to get murdered and be right. executed, you know. So I think it's always just surprised me, you know, that you know, communism by itself seems to have such lofty ideals about humanity and human dignity. And for it to be, you know, first tried out a fit in an official form by people who seem to have no real empathy for human beings is a little shocking. Well, the trouble with communism is it's an abstract utopian ideal that is impossible to uh, impose and live in practice because you can't impose that kind of rigid ideology on human beings. Look what happens, it becomes hideous and oppressive. I mean, look at communism in China. Look mm -hmm. at the oppression of people, the indoctrination, the brainwashing. Look at communism under Pol Pot communism at the height of the cold war in soviet russia when people for the slightest infringement of of, of you know uh, po political thinking would get mm -hmm. taken off to the gulag and shot i think it's uh, an impossible concept that you cannot impose on human beings certainly yeah i mean and I, you can make so many arguments that none of those really represent the true utopian ideas of uh, Karl Marx, right? Well, so I ask about that because with, I, I guess I feel like in the case, well, in the case of China, but in the case of, of course, the Soviet Union, more, more in your expertise, is all about these people's desire for power and aggrandizement, self-aggrandizement. Is that all it is for them? Well, the Stalin's alignment? Personality. Look at the, look at the cult of the personality in not just for the, the one that uh, Stalin created posthumously for Lenin. That was the beginning of it, but then it becomes absurdly inflated under Stalin, doesn't it? Yeah. This, yeah. this fanatical worship, almost akin to Kim Jong What's it in North Korea. This slavish adulation of Stalin. You've seen that footage of of appearances and conferences where they all start clapping and everyone's afraid to stop, be the yeah, first to stop. Yeah. It's terrifying. I think terrifying. we cannot begin to comprehend how frightening life must have been in Stalinist Russia at the height of the purges when literally, and I've read, I've read this said by people who were repressed and arrested and writers and stuff, that you literally were terrified of the knock on the door coming. Yeah. And, and um, Isaac Babel, one of my favorite Soviet short story writers, a Jewish sto short story writer, said that the only time it was safe to say how you really th thought and felt was under the bed covers at night with your wife, having you know, a secret conversation, whispering under the bed covers because people were watched and intimidated all the time and no and, and in fact so much so that they had a bag ready packed right in case the knock on the door came and they were hauled off for interrogation or prison or whatever so so knowing how tribalist sometimes people can be and in in russia like i mean just talk about like russian um I don't know if I'd call it racism, but they're certainly very nationalistic and, and sometimes, yeah. Um, I, I always found it a little bit- too, I'm afraid. Very, yes, very much so. And, um, um, dare I say anti-Semitic? Yes, yes, that's very, I mean, I still have friends living over there. 
You must have seen it in Ukraine. Oh, absolutely. I lived in uh, Dnipropetrovsk, which has a huge Jewish population. I'm told one of the biggest uh, outside of Israel in terms of um, just per capita number of Jewish people living there. Mm. And yeah, it's just so, (laughs) I've never heard so many anti-Semitic comments so brazenly. It's endemic. You know, it's this curious thing because having studied Imperial Russia, anti-Semitism was absolutely embedded in the Romanovs, in, in the Tsars, it was endemic in the aristocracy. In fact, if you look at our aristocracy between the wars, the interwar years, the, all the aristocracies of Europe, you know, that, uh, those early 30s when they flirted with Hitler and National Socialism, there was a, a nasty strain of anti-Semitism running through the upper classes, but particularly, yeah. I hate to say it, in the Russian aristocracy. So with, with Stalin, I, I think one of the things that have always puzzled me is how this, what I can only imagine, he would have been viewed as somewhat of a bumpkin, a, a Georgian backwards well, He was, he was a Georgian, guy. a Georgian cobbler's son. I've been, yeah. I've been to Gori where to he Gori? was- born. yeah. Yes, I went when they still had the huge Stalin statue in the square. They pulled it down after the Chechen War. And I had my photo taken sitting at Stalin's feet. And I went to the Stalin Museum, which was deserted and and was taken around by a very bemused guide. And they they, they were so poor that they would put the light on in each room as we went round. They didn't have them all on all the time. I saw the little hovel he was born in. This is going to sound like a strange way to ask this question then, but with all this working against him, you know, what was the secret of his success? He had charisma. It's hard to tell. You know, looking at, you know, like, look look at a speech of Hitler, you know, this guy had charisma. You look at a speech of Stalin, you think, what is, what's the appeal? He had, I, I can't explain it, but he had a certain charisma. Um... Uh, in an, is- an inscrutability. I mean, Hitler was a sort of neurotic firebrand and shrieking and, yeah. you know, fulminating. And Stalin was like a panther. He was, he was very reserved, very contained, enigmatic, quite charismatic. And of course, people adored him and worshipped him for the wrong reasons. It, right, it was right. kind of, a, you know, mental enslavement. But there was, you know, it's the cult of the personality that bigged him up because actually he was quite short. He had pockmarked face. That was all airbrushed out or before the days of airbrushing. But uh, and the other thing was he had slightly withered arm. Was it withered arm? Yes, I think it was. Did he have it crushed Uh, by by something when he was young? Yeah, I can't remember now. But anyway, he, you know, but of course, all the the massaging of photographic imagery was became an art form in the in the Stalin period when they airbrushed all these people out of pictures right. like uh, you know um, K- not Kirov who was the Yezhov the yeah. um, head of uh, secret police and, right. and Bukharin and as the people were bumped off and sent to the gulag you know they'd be erad- erased from the photographic records so they they became adept at massaging Stalin's image too. Yeah. And all these statues and busts and all the paraphernalia and parades, you know, this great cult was created yeah. around him. Which is excuse me, he got skin. No, no. Which is why, of course, when he died, there it's like when Kim Jong what now I can never remember. Kim Jong il or Kim Il when his father died. Yeah, People Kim Jong Il weeping and wailing and practically killing themselves on the streets. Right. It's the same when Stalin died. People were, you know, distraught. Yeah. And then you get this weird, perverse nostalgia for him. Uh, That's the saying, other oh, thing that I. Better, oh, it was better under Stalin because at least we had electricity and jobs, and now yeah. we, you know, under the communists we had that, but now it's all gone belly up. Well, yeah, ar- arguably, nobody was victimized more by Stalin than the Ukrainians. And I was baffled by how much he's revered in certain parts of Ukraine. Well, you know, they, they sell magnets, refrigerator magnets uh, with his he picture on it. 
them. He started yeah. the Great Famines of the early 30s when he took all their grain and sold it for export and millions starved. Yeah. I mean, how do you explain this love for him then? When, I when, can't. You'd have I to can't ask, either. You'd have to ask a North Korean why they adore, worship that little fat boy. I think, well, I think there's something different when you're still caught up in that regime because you're still very much under the spell of that propaganda, right? But now that Stalin is gone, communism's collapsed, all this information. Yeah, but how do they? Still no, people are still nostalgic about Stalin. I think oh, one of the really? major reasons the Great Patriotic War. The Great Patriotic because War. The heroism of World War Two. They came through that. Yeah. Um, and but really, I think it's for kind of more economic reasons. So, you know, under under the communists, under Stalin, they had a cradle to grave economy. You were born, you went to kindergarten, you went to school, you were given a job, you were given a horrible little flat, but you nevertheless had a flat. Yeah. You got your food coupons or whatever. When you died, you know, you were buried. Oh no, you got your pension and then you died. Life was orderly, organized, and mapped out for people. And um, once communism collapsed, all that went. People didn't get the pensions paid regularly anymore. Uh, the, the homes they lived in were neglected and became more and more run down. And everything, the whole infrastructure went. And they felt less secure. And I can remember little old ladies when, when, we, were, when we were on the Spear River and stopped just before getting into... Um, St. Petersburg on the cruise that I did, little old ladies standing with a jar of mushrooms or cranberries or a few potatoes from their garden trying to sell them. And I said, what, what's happening? What, what? Uh, they said, we haven't had our pensions for months. And these people are practically starving. And this was yeah. after the collapse of communism. Right. Well, yeah, I don't know. I just don't, yeah, it's that's heavy. It's heavy stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, but you, you really, I think I can't presume to understand it because I haven't lived it. I've lived in a free country. Thank God. And I'm grateful. But what those people have had to endure in the past, I cannot imagine. I really sometimes cannot imagine. I've always said they're among the strongest people on the planet. The Russian they're people. They're most long suffering. They have yeah. suffered uh, centuries of, press, of oppression. Yeah. You know, first the Tartars, it, well, you know, they had the despotic Tsars, then they had the Tartars invading, and then the Romanovs. Well, the Romanovs were, were pussycats compared to the communists. Um, but they've always had one form of totalitarian, totalitarian rule after another. And it's that, that famous saying, I, not famous saying, but the comment that the Tsaritsa Alexandra made after uh, when they were being pressurized, her and Nicholas were being pressurized to bring in reform and a constitution and democratic government. She said, the Russian people don't know how to do democracy. They don't know how to self-govern. They need a kriepki mm -hmm. a strong leader. And that's yeah. what the Russians loved about Stalin, a strong leader. They don't, that's why Putin, yeah. that's why Putin is, is continuing ad infinitum. He's a strong um, autocrat. They like they they seem to cope better with an autocracy than with democracy. How do you think Putin compares to Stalin, charismatically, well, personally? Well, I can't understand his. He's so inscrutable, isn't he? He's yeah. absolutely. And he's had so much done to his face. His face <laughs> is weird. He's had fillers on his cheeks and his eyes are disappearing. And yeah. he, looks, he looks embalmed. Yes. Uh, um, and I'm, I'm just appalled that that man technically is going to be in power for what, another 18 years? Seems like it. If you, if, as a historian and as a person who, again, who, who takes great pains to understand her subjects um if you had a chance to sit down with him what would you like oh, to ask him about I, I wouldn't i i don't think you could have an honest conversation with him end of story he's really? far too brutal no it'd be wasted waste of time you so then on that same note no, i don't you get a straight answer out of him or any of his bureaucrats 
or on that same note case. then with, without using i try to avoid superlatives here but is there is there the, the person who you most wish you would have gotten a chance to meet in all of your historical oh history? crikey well, maybe a couple of them oh anton chekhov chekhov and i did admire tarkovsky mm. film. Yeah. yes me too uh and also the act that gorgeous actor who played Prince Andre in Bondarchi War and Peace. <laughs> and I can't remember his name. Was it Yuri Temikaman? I can't remember his name. But he was very, very handsome. Oh, there's so many interesting people in history. Goodness me, I couldn't I couldn't begin to list all of them. Oh, I know what you mean. Um, I, I, so I wouldn't be talking... And anyway, you. I think, you know, oh gosh, you, you know, they, they have these things where they say, what six people from history would you invite to a dinner? Exactly, party? yeah. And yeah. I think, I'm sure they'd probably be a disappointment. I think so too. Was. I love to ask that question. You'd be, I don't know, maybe you wouldn't be surprised, but how often Hitler comes up when you ask people that? To a dinner party? Yes, which I think is a horrible guest. He would be the worst guy to sit and talk to. Well, he'd let you. He'd harangue. Exactly. Yes. It doesn't sound interesting. No, I, I, I think a lot of people who we look upon as heroes probably have feet of clay and quite boring. Perhaps quite boring so, yeah. Private yeah. Lives. yeah. I think people choose him a lot. And, and by people, I mean people who aren't even interested in history. Just casual. Some of my students, you know, or teenagers might say him. And it's interesting because they're not necessarily... I wouldn't say like uh, white supremacists or people who are interested in, in that. I mean, even Latina females have said Hitler. I think they pick him in a sense just because it's they're grasping at his spring, historical spring figure. Spring. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that is weird. I, I think, think so too. I find him quite frightening. <laughs> <laughs> or, or just a, uh, silly in a sense. Like, I don't, it, it is silly actually. Yeah. Silly. Yeah. I think between the two, I'd rather have dinner with Stalin. He just seemed like a more interesting guy and a better conversationalist. Well, he, yeah, he you probably get drunk with Stalin. Well, I don't know. Stalin was always very clever about drinking. He, he used to get all the Politburo to his, out to his dacha yeah. uh, and make them all get drunk and and be entertained by they, them making complete prats of themselves, you know, yeah. Do you think that they could have held on to power without their reign of terror? Do you think Ooh. there was something necessary about that, the Bolsheviks? Held on to power? Well, their, their, their power actually, their hold on power for the first six months, if not longer, was incredibly precarious. And, yeah. if, the, and if Kerensky and the opposition and the provisional government got their act together, there wouldn't have been a Bolshevik coup and there shouldn't have been a Bolshevik coup. Um, it was a, a lucky break because the provisional government were just so inefficient and so badly organized. And, um, and then even after the Bolshevik coup in October, things were very dodgy, certainly until the spring of the following year, until they, they made the pact with Germany and came out of the war. So, yeah, I think things could have been different if Nicholas had actually really got his act together and instituted proper democratic constitutional reform in 1905 after the, Feb after the um, bloody, bloody Sunday um, revolution and, and, the, and the killings of the protesters. But he just kept dissolving the Duma as fast as he, um, it was set up again. So... His, the writing was on the wall for him when he didn't really didn't compromise on constitutional reform. In in his final year, how much self reflection do you think? Or I'm sure he did a lot of self reflection, but how much of that do you think he realized and regretted? I think he and uh, Alexander were both very stubbornly in denial about how desperately serious and precarious the situation was. Everyone was telling them, the members of their own family, the diplomats, the foreign, you know, foreign, foreign, uh, foreign representatives they met were all warning them. You do realize you're on the edge of the volcano, that a revolution is coming unless you act. I, from my own point of view, I know the British ambassador in Petrograd, uh, Sir George Buchanan, was begging the Tsar, for God's sake, do something or your throne is going to fall. 
and they would say no 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 the russian people really love us this will you know this will pass over you know it's not as bad as you think and they were complacent and they thought the peasants loved them and uh, bingo it all crashed so even all, all, all the way up to the end do you think he was still in denial uh, I think he was, and uh, unfortunately, he was away at Stavka, at Army HQ. At I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I mean the end of his life. Do you think he, would, he still thought that there was a way out of this, that he'd be restored? No, 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 no. He did not want a restoration of the throne. He did not want the throne back. And by the time they were murdered in Ekaterinburg, I think he and Alexander had become, well, they always were pretty fatalistic very devoutly Russian Orthodox. And I think they've become pretty much resigned that they were gonna die at some point. The awful thing was, of course, they never thought for a moment anyone would kill their children. Right. And that was what was so horrific about it. So in so many other accounts of their lives, the children, of course, kind of get short shrift, I feel. Right? They're kind of a backseat to a lot of the action. What were some of the most interesting things that you learned about their children, their personalities? Again, you delve into their well, that's their why I, That's exactly why I wrote Four Sisters. Yeah. Because uh, in the scheme of things, until I wrote my book, okay, you read about Nicholas and Alexander, there's plenty about them. There's a bit about Alexei because he was the heir to the throne. And of course, because of haemophilia and the influence of Rasputin. And the girls were just wallpaper. They were yeah. just pretty girls in white frocks with big hats who looked gorgeous. And everyone thought, thought and did exactly the same and had no personalities and were terribly boring. And I thought, I want to give those girls their lives back. I want to show that they were interesting human beings and very different, which they were. And that, you know, what they managed, what they did in their short lives is not without note and, and um, compliment because during the war years, they, they really did rise to the challenge in helping with the wounded and the older two in the hospital, of course as nurses so i felt that we just knew nothing about them they were they were just cut out uh, pretty girls um ciphers and mm. when i started researching their lives i had to do a lot of very intensive searching because the material on them was very fragmented and very scattered but i managed i think to piece together a fairly a good portrait of four very different very interesting young women very. But I see, I like doing that in my work. I like recovering the stories and lives of people who've been overlooked, who are just a footnote, who get a passing mention in other books. So you're, your, your brother's a photographer, right? Um, my, my, el no, no, uh, my eldest brother is a specialist in uh, early photographic techniques, but he's now uh -huh. retired. So I, I asked because I asked because uh, so I studied photojournalism at university and I recently talked to um, a professor of photojournalism uh, whose work I admire a lot. And one of the things he told me about his work is that he credits his success with being where the other photographers aren't. So when he goes to an event, you've got a group of photographers standing together, taking the same kind of pictures. He yeah. wanders off and finds something else. And that's honestly what I thought a lot about your work, you know, as a That's, that's really nice. Historian. Yeah. That is exactly what I try and do. Yeah. Every big story in history, you know, Stalin, Lenin, the Romanovs, the revolution, the big story is often being told, but take your camera up and look at it from a different angle. So for example, with the Russian Revolution, I thought, yeah, there's loads and loads of stuff in Russian about the Russian experience of revolution, but I knew there were a lot of Brits and Americans and also French diplomats and others in Petrograd when the revolution broke, who'd seen it happen, who'd seen the rioting, who'd seen people dropping in the snow, seen the shooting. And I thought, I want to look at the revolution from the other side of the street through the eyes of the Brits and the Americans who witnessed it happening. And there is always another way of looking at it. That's why when I did Lenin, I thought, no, I don't want to do the whole life. I want to look at that part of the life that was his road to revolution, that made him the man, the leader who took over 
in you know at the end of 1917 and similarly <clears throat> with the race to save the Romanovs no one had really put the microscope over what happened in that sort of 18 months from the abdication to the murder what really went on behind the scenes right what kind of diplomatic efforts or not were made was it all george's fault i felt that was too much of a knee-jerk response and that yeah. it had to be much more complex and subtle than that so um you know, oh and of course the last classic example of my approach is the katerinburg the first romanov book i did where i just looked at the last two weeks of their lives because I didn't, again, I didn't want to do a big biography. I wanted to really focus in what happened in that house in Ekaterinburg during those last 14 days. And so there's always another more imaginative, different, um, interesting way of looking at history. You just got to change the focus and the position of the camera. And getting that close to it, you know, zeroing in on the last two weeks, I mean, writing you know, the books that you have about them, they must really haunt you a, a quite oh a bit. Oh God, they do. That book did. Because yeah. in order to write that story, as you know, that the murder of the Romanovs was incredibly botched, very uh, gruesome, hideous, frightening, you name it. And I had to get inside my head what was happening. And I had to think of that 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 20 minutes from different points of view so i had to write a very layered chapter first of all i gave i wrote what i thought was the best account of what happened just putting the pieces in position and then i wrote it from the point of the view of the romanos being shot at and then the point of view of the killers shooting them. And in the end, I went and talked to a ballistics expert, a forensics expert witness about what happens to people's bodies when you <coughs> fire at them at a close range in a small room. Sorry about the dog. Um, and, and without that explanation of the forensics, I could never have really comprehended what was going on. Shush! Sorry. Sorry, okay, no, this is a dog. Shush! <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, you know, that was really interesting because I spent five hours sitting in a, in a, a little bistro with this expert witness, um, and he explained to me what happens to bodies when you shoot at them, and... And you know, heads exploding, and you name it. It was very grisly, but I had to understand. I had to understand. Oh, wow. And wow. one of the first th myths he he busted for me, which I already knew was a myth, was this stupid story that the bullets bounced off the girls because they'd sewn some of Alexandra's jewelry in their corsets. Well, they weren't corsets. They weren't boned corsets that acted like flak jackets. They were silk camisoles where they sewed perhaps rows of pearls, the odd diamond here and there. And as um, this guy explained to me, the first thing about that kind of jewelry is pearls would not, the bullets would not bounce off pearls if they would push the pearls into the body or they oh, would just shatter. Man. And you know, but yeah, but, it was only after he told me all this that I could write a more, more honest account and, and scotch that myth, which is a joke. The bullets yeah. did not bounce off the girls. The, she, the killers were so inept and there was so much chaos. There was acrid smoke. It was a dimly lit room and people were running around screaming. And the other thing he explained to me, if you got say seven or eight guys all shooting madly at people running around screaming, or most of them were, um, it's very easy to miss. He said, it's unbelievably easy to miss if you are not really trained in the use of your weapon. And most of those guys had just been handed the Nagants and the Colts or whatever they had the night before. They'd had no practice, no training, nothing. And so the whole thing became a bloodbath. My God. What, why does it, why, why do, 
why do they matter now? And so that's kind of a rude way to ask about them. Yeah, why I do they matter now? The Romanovs. Yeah. I think you have to separate. I think what matters and what haunts people and haunts me is the murder of the children. Right. Sorry, I've got hiccups. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> and people find it very hard to come to terms with the brutality of the way in which those children were killed. And I think that's why the fantasy, the hope, the dreams, all the conspiracy theories about one or other or all of them getting away, or Anastasia in particular, is, 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 is people don't want to have to accept that they were all so hideously murdered, that yeah. this faint hope that one might have survived it. But it is a fantasy. And I still get emails from people claiming that they're a of course. miraculous yeah. survival because they don't want to let go, even with all the DNA testing and all the forensics. But it's still, I, don't, I don't know what to do with this thought, but it's just sad that, you know, so many other children, of course, were killed because of, of Nicholas's policies. And, uh, I, I make know. that point, actually, in, yeah. in Aschenberg. I remember during the revolution and the civil war that followed, about 11 million people died. 11 million. The Romanovs were about seven. Yeah. among that and okay lots of children lots of families were slaughtered in horrific circumstances no they shouldn't matter more than all these unnamed families and people who suffered horribly horrible violence yeah. um uh, it, it's because the, the romantic attachment yeah. to the romanovs it's, it's a royalty right it's royalty, royalty in general. it's bling it's palaces it's you know, yeah. it's it's all muddled up with Doctor Zhivago and Lara sure. and the snow and the 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 troikas in you know and the church bells ding 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 ding. This is all part of the Russian fantasy. Yeah. So two it's two very, things I want. It's very very seductive. Absolutely. There, there's two two things I want to end on. Um, the first, what lessons can we learn from the Russian Revolution that we can apply to today? today's tumultuous times. We, we don't have to get too into politics, but just what major lessons? History repeats itself. Mm -hmm. And we have to be very careful what we wish for. Yeah. Um, I, I watch some of, some of the very extremist, ranting, uh, oppressive behavior of certain elements and it scares me. It really scares me because I see echoes of what's me happened too. in the past. Me too. I mean, people haranguing and shouting like the, uh, the people in China during yeah. the Cultural Revolution or, or this sh public shaming of people being harassed and fists in their faces. I'm sorry. I just, I think Can it's I frightening. Can I share one thing with you that I think is especially frightening after reading your book, Caught in the Revolution, that maybe is unique to Americans? Um, it seems to me a lot of what happened in that revolution turned on the fact that certain people had guns and other people didn't. And, that, and here in America, I, I think a lot about that, that a lot of people have guns and a lot of people don't. No, they didn't have the weapons. The rep, those not really those revolutionaries the people the grassroots protesters who kick-started the revolution in february really didn't have any weapons to start off with well and, they, i meant the people who ended up well wrestling oh, power yeah it, it all came down to like who had access to the weapons in the end yeah in the end but the whole infrastructure had collapsed in the end and the bolsheviks were quicker and cleverer and seized power over a very inept and incompetent government. A better government would have suppressed the Bolsheviks months earlier, and that would never have happened. Um, I, I think it's very difficult to be sure what may or may not have happened there, but yeah. I, it, it, there was a huge amount. What I noticed doing the research and what the eyewitnesses talked about was this very intense class hatred mm -hmm. absolutely vitriolic class hatred where people would say i don't go out with a smart pair of boots on or a nice fur coat because i'll be accused of being bourgeois 
you know, and you could get jumped on and attacked and murdered and robbed if you looked bourgeois. Um, the class war elements, the, they, the, the, I see some echoes now, and it, again, I find it all very unnerving as a historian. As do I. Okay, so to not end on such a dour note, let me ask you, what was it like growing up um, around where Charles Dickens? Oh, well, that's the other love of my yeah. life. Yeah. The, 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 the Kent marshes, that the sort of listening to the seabirds walking ac along the seawall in northeast Kent because direct if you look directly across the river Medway from where my parents house was the other side of it is a place called Cooling and there's a little church there with a churchyard with seven little sarcophagi of seven children who all died in one family. And that features in the very opening of Great Expectations, where oh, Magwitch yes, of is hiding out in the churchyard and Pip, uh, he, you know, grabs Pip yeah. by the scruff of the neck. And yeah. Dickens used to walk that seawall for miles and miles and miles. And I love it. It's, it's not a particularly pretty part of Kent. The mudflats, the river, and Rochester is, was not far from where I grew up, but it's re very deep in my psyche that, um, and I think out of that sense of, uh, of the river and Dickens grew my love of Victorian history as well. Yeah, there wasn't a family connect. I mean, there must have been, right? I mean, cause well, you're from England, so yes, you, yeah. My father worked in, in the dockyard where Dickens's father had worked, not as a labourer, but in right. one of the admiralty offices. Um, my father worked there. My mother later worked in an office in the dockyard. So yeah, my family had a connection, but not with the actual... Oh, and my brother, sorry, I tell you my... My youngest brother, one of my twin youngest brothers, was a shipwright and trained in the dockyard, refitting subs, where they built, you know, Nelson's Navy. Yeah. So yeah, we have a family connection, I, you know. I guess, of course, um, and and it, it's it's a part of Kent that's very deep in my psyche. If you were to recommend a book for somebody who does not know a lot about Dickens, where would you recommend they start? Oh gosh, well there are lots of good books about Dickens. Um, I mean that he wrote. Excuse me. Oh, but that he wrote. Yeah, well, I absolutely love Bleak House. Bleak House and Great Expectations. They're not, I mean, his, his novels are big, they're dense, yeah, yeah. full of detail, because he was writing um, to order for serialization, and he had to produce so many words a week, these great long serials that right. were published in the magazines. So you can tell very quickly bits of padding, and you can skip the bits of padding, but I absolutely love Bleak House. It's my favorite. That's got to be the next one I read. I've only read Great Expectations and Tale of Two Cities. Well, Great Expectations is wonderful too because that very it has very strong echoes of Kent uh, for me. Um, but there are wonderful moments in all Dickens novels. Of course, um, they just captivating. They, the characterization is just incredible. The people he creates, for sure. Helen, thank you so much for doing this interview. You're welcome. So uh, <laughs> I'll stop the recording now.